All right, welcome back. I have a chance to give three lectures this weekend. As I say, every, every lecture I give is not all brand new, but pretty new. You haven't heard it before, and I've never given it before, and uh, that puts me at a disadvantage or an advantage. At least everything's new for you and I. So this is based, uh, the last lecture I gave you was based on my May 2016 newsletter. I told you, do not, Kath, I will sue. Some people think I thought I was a little rough on my colleagues, but these are big men and women. They ought to be able to defend what they do. Don't you think some little old Dr. McDougall makes them uh, quiver and shake? Oh, just too bad. I'll lay awake and worry about their welfare, maybe in 15 years. OK, so this, this uh, present presentation, if you'd like to see the links, I don't give references anymore. That's too cumbersome. What I do is put in links, or my good friend Neil Hedrickson does. Puts in links so you don't have to bother to look it up. It's just like, bing, you know how the word works today. And this is based on my July 2016 newsletter. It's called, Up the Wrong Butt. Do I need to explain that to you? Okay. Uh, my first patient, when I was a young medical student that I saved. I felt so proud of myself. I must have been in my third year of medical school. And I saw this uh, old man. He was like 85, at least years old. And uh, I uh, did uh, my rectal exam on him, and I discovered colon cancer in the man. And I sent him to the surgeons. Oh, you know, here I was doing my job, doing my job. I was, almost a real doctor, and sent him to the surgeons. And about uh, three months later, I met the surgeon. I, I said, how's uh, Mr. So-and-so doing? Uh, he said, uh, he died on the operating table. <sighs> what a wake-up call for a third-year medical student that saved a life. He died, 85, enjoying life on the operating table. So let's see. I've been a long, uh, long time at this, and I've uh, met many people who have uh, been consoling to me, have helped me. And I've told you about four of them, Nathan Pritikin, Dennis Burkett, uh, uh, Walter Kepner, and uh, Roy Swank. Uh, but these are the people's shoulders I stand on, Colin Campbell, S warnings, et cetera, they're like shoulder to shoulder. They don't stand on their shoulders. But here's a man whose shoulders I stand on. Uh, his name is, was, he has died, uh, Ernst Winder, uh, head of the American Health Foundation, big organization, over 200 scientists, uh, founder of Preventive Medicine Journal, published in his group more than 800 scientific papers. He was my friend. Uh, you know, it takes a long time for me to make these friendships, but he was my friend. Had him on the radio show. You can actually hear an interview that I did of Ernst Winder. If you go to my uh, July 2016 newsletter, there's a link, and you can hear Ernst and I discussing uh, health and diet. And so on many, what was it, 19, uh, 19, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to the date, 1978 maybe. And uh, we discussed, uh, it's on the radio show a few years later. So you can get to know Dr. Winder. Well, Dr. Winder uh, and I met for the first time at a conference uh, that was put on in Seattle, Washington. And that was uh, 1978. And we had breakfast together, he and I did, at this hotel in Seattle. Waitress came up and said, uh, what do you want for breakfast? And Dr. Winder said, what, whatever he's ordering. <laughs> and I ordered uh, oatmeal and uh, fruit. And that's what Dr. Winder and I had that morning for breakfast, along with a couple other people. And he says to me, this, he says to me, this is the man, by the way, who discovered the connection between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. He said to me at that morning breakfast, as we started our breakfast, he said to me, you know, John, I went to Sloan Kettering and all the other researchers uh, of his time. He said, I went to them uh, in the 1950s. This was published in, what, 1950. He said, I went to my colleagues and I said, 
cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. And they said, nah, how could that be? He said, well, what you do is you take this uh, tube of tobacco, and you light it, and you suck it into your lungs, and it causes lung cancer. They said, I can hardly, I can't believe that. So breakfast continues. Uh, it's Dr. Winder's classic paper, published in 1950. So breakfast continues, and we get along a few uh, minutes later. He says to me, you know, uh, John, he said, uh, 10 years later, I went to Sloan Kettering and the other experts, and, they, and I told them, I said, uh, I said to them, diet causes colon cancer. And they said, nah. How could that be? And Dr. Winter says, well, you know, you chew up these stuff and you swallow it and it goes into your colon and causes colon cancer. And of course, he published the scientific data on that a uh, long, long time ago. Why do I know diet causes colon cancer? Why, why do I know that? I told you my eyes were opened in 1971 by this uh, very important surgeon from Edinburgh, Scotland, who uh, after uh, his training went with Clive and Walker, his uh, friends, and they went to Uganda in Africa. And uh, there he worked for 17 years. And he became the head of ministries of health of Uganda uh, oversaw 10 million people, 1,000 hospitals. And he came to my medical school when I was a senior medical student and Mary and I were together. He came to my medical school and changed my life. I hated being a doctor, by the way, then, the medical student. I couldn't see any purpose. I thought I was stupid. Nothing made sense. All these noontime conferences. I'm not talking about acute problems like infections or broken bones. I'm talking about chronic disease. It just didn't make any sense to me, and I saw no future. And then Dr. Dennis Burkett came in to our Noonkind conference. He was visiting Kellogg Cereal Company in Battle Creek uh, to suggest to Americans, this is 1971, to suggest to uh, Americans eat more fiber. He was known as the fiber man. And I listened to him tell me that uh, in his 17 years, 10 million people, 1,000 hospitals, he never saw colon cancer, never saw hemorrhoids, diverticular disease, varicose veins, obesity. Saw one case of gallbladder disease in 17 years. He saw one heart attack, and that was from a, uh, um, an attorney who went to London to uh, learn about law and the practice of law. And, came back to Uganda and had a heart attack. It's the only heart attack he saw in 70 years. And so I was so excited, I went home to Mary and I said, you know Mary, you just can't believe what I heard. From now on, we're no longer eating white bread, we're gonna have brown bread with our bacon and eggs. <laughs> and that's all it took was that much to just kind of open my eyes and uh, start me thinking as I hope myself and uh, my colleagues and the speakers here have done for you if you haven't had them fully opened, at least we maybe made a crack in your vision. Edinburgh, Scotland, quite an accent. If you look at the, the diet of disease of the countries throughout the world who don't get the common diseases of Western culture, and when I say the common diseases, I mean diseases like atherosclerosis, diabetes, gallstones, bowel cancer, breast cancer, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, and diverticular disease, huge pile of stuff. The countries who don't get these diseases have a diet with far more starch, far more fiber, far less fat, far less sugar, far less salt. And the two major things we need is to eat more fiber and less fat. Did you hear that word starch? Yeah, that's what uh, we used to call what I recommend as starch until industry got involved and they had to change the nomenclature to fool the customer. So starch disappeared, the word, what grandma used to say was starch we're having for Sunday for dinner, and they replaced it with complex carbohydrate. You look at your plate, you have complex carbohydrate? 
I don't have any idea what that is. And uh, also in the dietary uh, guidelines, uh, when they talk about the negative things of food, they never talk about meat, poultry, and dairy. They talk about saturated fat and cholesterol. So if you have the language, you can control the population. OK, so uh, there's one slide that I remember Dr. Burkett showed. And this is my memory, not the actual slide. He uh, showed a slide uh, that uh, made a lot of sense even to me at that time. He showed uh, tiny rock hard bowel movements are associated with big hospitals. And small hospitals are associated with big bowel movements. Do you get it? Do you understand what he was saying? OK. Constipation. Well, you see, I spent years recognizing that fiber related to bowel behavior, recognizing that in people who had adequate bowel behavior, they virtually never had a lot of our Western diseases. And I really copied the example of my friend Alec Walker in South Africa, who has looked at thousands of students. But you see, now we know from the evidence available that the average American who isn't a vegetarian only passes about 80 to 130 grams of stool a day. In people who, and elderly people under 50, <coughs> and whereas in countries that don't get bowel cancer, breast cancer, <coughs> gallstones, coronary heart disease, so on, they pass <laughs> three to 500 grams of stool a day. And I think we are genetically, as it were, coded up or made to get on with far more fiber than we take. And I think our relationship to, well, there was always causative relationship, but our relationship to a lot of our Western diseases is related to what I might call our national constipation. <laughs> All right, if you want to learn more about uh, Dr. Dennis Burkett, you go to my January 2013 newsletter where an entire one hour interview is uh, available. It's the only interview ever done of Dr. Dennis Burkett. And I had the opportunity as a young doctor to interview him, to sit him down, and have him explain to you uh, why people are sick. In my February newsletter, you'll find uh, my interview with Nathan Pritigan, 2013. In my December 2013 newsletter, you'll find uh, not an interview with Walter Kempner, because he never allowed his photograph to be taken, but an interview of his disciples, Robert Rosati, and Frank Nealon, who have been speakers here. So it's all there for you. If you just want to do a little extra work, you can meet the people who I, uh, who I stand on the shoulders of. Yes, so uh, we know it causes colon cancer from Dennis uh, Burkett and Ernst Winder. I, who could argue otherwise that what you put in your colon causes health or disease? Uh, colon cancer, let's just talk about how it develops. Uh, it's due to uh, irritation caused by bad foods and the bacteria that grow as a result of eating bad foods. And uh, that's as complicated as I have to make it. Uh, irritation causes, uh, on the skin, it causes keratinization. or You get a little uh, scaly. But in mucous membranes, like the colon, the cervix, uh, in mucous membranes, the result of irritation is cell proliferation. So the cells grow into mounds. And if you uh, start the progression on the left side, you see that irritation, proliferation of cells. And as con uh, irritation continues, these uh, cell proliferations get bigger. And we soon call them polyps. And as uh, polyps grow bigger, they get so irritated, they make a transition to cancer. The uh, time uh, from progression of initial irritation to the development of uh, frank colon cancer is uh, 5 to 20 years, on average 15, of irritation. And when they get big enough, what happens is these polyps turn to cancer and invade into the uh, mucous membranes of the bowel and spread to other parts of the body. You can take the venous blood of people who are, quote, uh, early stage cancer. 
And you can find about 40 to 50 percent of them, if you look at the blood cells draining the tumor, the venous, uh, venous blood, you'll find colon cancer cells in that blood of people who are essentially uh, curable from colon cancer. So it continues to develop, and it's a long, long history. And how many people have polyps on the Western diet? About half, yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, a timeline that I published oh, probably 30 years after I had this discussion going with you. And every good oncologist or doctor knows about the natural history of cancer. You need to know this because then you understand why it's not treatable and early detection does not work. If you understand the natural history, just like when I talked to you about plaque rupture, you understand why heart disease surgery and chronic disease cannot possibly work. Once you understand the natural history of cancer, you'll understand why early detection and treatment cannot possibly work. Uh, what happens uh, is one cell leads the way in the breast, the prostate, or the colon makes that transition from normal to uh, cancer. And one of the qualities of cancer is that these cells, they double at their own free will. You're not allowed to double at your own free will and if you're a cell. Unless you're a cell of a child, and you could double as you grow. That's under direction. Or uh, if you cut yourself badly, the cells at the edge of the wounds can uh, proliferate and close the wound. Otherwise, cells are not allowed to double at their own, or grow at their own, or proliferate at their own free will. And, but they get damaged, and most uh, seriously damaged cells, they die. But some don't die. They just lose control. And they proliferate at their own free will. Not as wildfire, but in a very slow progression. Prostate, colon cancer, breast cancer, if you want to take the Average doubling time, cells double at every three and a half months or every 100 days. So you start with one cell in a breast that contains 100 billion cells per breast, or a prostate that contains 100 billion cells per prostate. You start with one cell that changes its behavior. It doubles 100 days later to two. 100 days later, it doubles to four, et cetera, et cetera. You've had cancer for a year, and you've got 12 cells lurking in a breast or prostate of 100 billion cells. A breast, okay. Same thing with the colon. You've got 12 cells. You've had a cancer for a year. And then divisions continue. You go uh, uh, 64, uh, finally at the average doubling rate, you develop a tumor the size of a period on a pencil. It's a millimeter in size. It contains a it contains one million cells. That's, that, that takes six years to develop. Uh, well, well before that, if it's truly cancer, and a lot of what's diagnosed as cancer really isn't, but it's truly cancer well before that when it was 64 cells or 300 cells, it is uh, broken into the bloodstream and the venous system and spread to other parts of the body, lungs, liver, brain, etc. That's the natural history. So it's a million cells, and you still can't find it by any technique in the breast, the prostate, the colon. It takes until uh, it gets to one centimeter, which is uh, one billion cells, before a tumor is big enough in the prostate to raise PSA. That's 10 years of development. Excuse me, early detection? That is a serious misnomer. It's always late detection. Now, once you understand the natural history, then everything else is clear about uh, why we cannot, uh, quote, uh, early detect or success successfully treat cancers. They can be prevented, but by the time they're found, their, uh, their fate has already been determined. Sorry to ruin your day. So let's see, the options for screening. I think people should be screened uh, for colon cancer. And the reason is, uh, you know I don't recommend PSA or digital rectal exams. You know I don't recommend breast self-examination. You know this, right? I've been absolutely clear with you. I do not recommend mammograms. 
But I do recommend checking your stool uh, to detect colon cancer. And the reason I do this is most of the people that I know have uh, changed, have uh, only changed their diet since they've met me. Prior to that, they ate the, ate the rich Western diet. And uh, I asked them to check, their, uh, check for uh, colon cancer beginning at about the age of 60. I think that's reasonable. And what do I recommend? I recommend that you have your stool tested for blood. There are a couple different methods. Age 60 and maybe every other year after that. Or I recommend you get one sigmoid exam at about age 60. Sigmoid, that's like a, what we're talking about, it's like a two foot tube. There are other ways to do early detection. There are at least seven recognized methods that you may want to avail yourself to. You may think I'm radical, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Canadian guidelines for 2016 came out clearly and told you not to do colonoscopy, the Canadian citizens. Told Canadian citizens to not do colonoscopy for early detection. You can read it, screening using colonoscopy. We recommend not using colonoscopy as a primary screening test for colon rectal cancer. Do you see those words? Is there any ambiguity to what they are saying? What they do recommend is they uh, recommend uh, checking the stool for blood in a one sigmoid exam. Uh, that's the uh, Canadian guidelines. I told you this. Now, it's not like we're having the first conversation about this. I've been telling you this for 30 years. And I, I sent you a newsletter in 2010, August of 2010. I sent you a newsletter that told you to refuse colonoscopy. And boy, did I get reaction from uh, gastroenterologists. Huh, some of them sitting right in this room. Just, uh, in fact, the next newsletter is the, the responses that they gave to me. And you could read what they had to say. This is, let's uh, 2010, August, that's uh, six years, right? Because the evidence is, was as crystal clear then as it is now about the benefits and harms of this uh, screening test. We're talking about screening. We're not talking about you having a problem and needing a colonoscopy or other exam. We're talking about looking for disease. It's called uh, disease mongering. There are two ways where you and I can develop a relationship. One is you can get sick and you can come to me and you can ask for my help. The, uh, the value of the evidence that I use to treat you doesn't have to be great because you came and asked me for help. The other way we can develop a relationship is this. You're out gardening, playing with the grandkids, uh, playing on your computer, and I come and knock on your door. And I say, you need to have your prostate checked. You need to have your breast checked. You need to have a colonoscopy, etc. In that case, there better be absolutely no question that I do you more good than harm. Any disagreement? Okay, you understand the difference. It's called disease mongering, which is turning healthy people into patients. All right, so I told you, don't do that. I mean, please, excuse me, stop doing this. Uh, colonoscopy versus sigmoidoscopy. You're talking about sigmoidoscopy, which would be on your right, is a two-foot tube stuck in your butt. And when we used to do it, they were like uh, rigid silver tubes. Some of you remember that. Now they do it with a, a very soft, flexible tube. Uh, you don't need any anesthesia. It takes you just a few minutes of your day. Uh, very simple to do. And what it examines is the left side of the colon. And evidence uh, says, in my understanding, clearly that the only way you can reduce the risk of dying from colon rectal cancer, you listen to those words, the only risk, way to reduce the risk of dying of colon rectal cancer is to remove polyps in the left side of the colon, which are reachable by sigmoid. Removing polyps in the right side of the colon for various reasons that you can read in my August 2010 newsletter does not prolong or does not reduce the risk of dying of 
colon rectal cancer. So, uh, what would you rather have? A six foot tube stuck up your butt, have an anesthesia, or uh, do a you know, five minute office procedure? Well, it depends on which side of the table you're on, what you'd like to do. Cash is king. To check your stool for blood costs you between $3 and $40. To do a sigmoid exam, and by the way, it's uh, painless and uh, ad no adverse side effects, no risks. To do a sigmoid exam costs $200 done in an office without any anesthesia. To do a colonoscopy is done in a medical center, a hospital, with sedation, anesthesia, and cost $3,000. Uh, the reduction is a reduction in death from colon rectal cancer. Listen to my words. There is no reduction in overall mortality, only in how you are going to die. You can reduce the risk of dying of colorectal cancer. You have to screen 377 people with stool for blood to uh, save one life. And to do a sigmoid exam, you have to, you have to do a sigmoid exams on 850 people to save one life from colon cancer. Not from overall death, but from colon cancer. Uh, see, the problem with a colonoscopy is that you kill people. Uh, the uh, serious complication rate is 7%. The risk of uh, having a perforation is about 1 in 2,000. And the risk of dying from such a perforation about, is about 1 in 1,000. So you may save a life in terms of colon cancer, but you kill them in other ways. It's the same thing with breast cancer and prostate cancer. You may reduce disease-specific mortality, but not overall mortality. And what you care about is not how you die, but when you die. Yeah? OK. So uh, colonoscopy does not reduce uh, in this paper it says it does not reduce colorectal cancer mortality. Let's see what they have to say. This was published August 2016. However, uh, colonoscopy we're talking about, let's, uh, listen to the words of this uh, uh, writer, professional, uh, world expert. Uh, you can, you know, all you have to do is you just have to go to a journal, a JAMA Internal Medicine, and you just have to sign up and the article's free. So don't take my word for it, it's free. You can just download it. So what does the, uh, the writer say? He says, uh, however, there is no randomized clinical trial or other high quality evidence showing that colonoscopy reduces colorectal cancer mortality. In fact, the only tests shown to reduce colon rectal cancer mortality in randomized control trials are periodic stool checks or a one-time sigmoid exam. Are we all up to speed? All right. Uh, this is a colon rectal cancer mortality, not overall mortality. There's no evidence that it reduces colon rectal cancer mortality. So the uh, newest uh, 2016 U.S. Preventative Services Task Force guidelines came out just a few weeks ago, June 2016. Strongly recommends that you, uh, you screen for colorectal cancer. I told you I recommend that too. They strongly recommend it. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. Remember, the Canadian Preventative Task Force said, not to get colonoscopy, and there is no European country that recommends colonoscopy for its citizens to, re to uh, screen for colon cancer. No, you know, no European country does. But the U.S. does recommend uh, that you screen, as I've told you I do, and they give you seven possibilities to screen, which I listed for you a little bit before, but let's just go over them again. Seven options, they say, in the research papers published in JAMA, a couple of months ago, they give you the option of colonoscopy, which they put first, by the way. Uh, Fleximal sigmoid. Uh, CT virtual colonoscopy, which they do by 
a very fast x-ray technique, or uh, checking the stool for blood. So there are seven different options you break them down. But uh, look at the words in red that they clearly say. They are not presented in any preferred or ranked order. So what, you're tell what they're telling you is you could check your stool for blood for $4, or you could have a colonoscopy for $3,000. You could do something that is absolutely harmless, or you could risk your life. This is what I want you to think about screening, is what they're asking you do, to do in terms of screening is they're asking you to risk your life today for the theoretical possibility that you will not die of prostate, colon, or breast cancer in 10, 20, or 30 years. So the US uh, Preventative Services Guidelines still back the $10 billion a year business that uh, we have in the United States. They say colonoscopy remains the uh, criterion standard, the gold standard. Do you understand what I mean by gold? <laughs> it is the gold standard. However, they go on to say uh, colonoscopy is significantly more invasive. Procedural complications include bleeding, perforation, and anesthesia plus the overdiagnosis of cancer. You find cancer that you would have never known about if you hadn't looked. You become a cancer victim by looking for the problem, which would have never shown up. Overdiagnosis and overtreatment of small lesions. Not only do you have to have those polyps removed, but once you become diagnosed, you're in the business, and you're told you must have a repeat colonoscopy every one to 10 years. There is absolutely no evidence that these repetitive tests after finding polyps will prolong your life, but it's absolutely clear in my mind that every time you have one of these tests, you risk your life. I know I'm too harsh. So what have I recommended? <clears throat> I uh, recommended number one, eat a healthy diet, a la Ernst Winder, Dennis Burkett. It doesn't make sense to you what you put in your colon affects health and disease. Yes? No argument. I recommend that you check your stool uh, and or have one sigmoid exam at age uh, 60. Why 60? Well, you're 60 and you find uh, polyps, et cetera. How long does it take for it to kill you? to develop colon frank colon cancer. It takes 10, 15, 20, 30 years. You're 90 years old by the time you reap the benefits. So 60 seems like a good age. Younger people, even though it does occur, uh, the yield is small in terms of the cost and risk. So uh, it's not recommended before 60. Uh, it's not recommended after 60 because of what I just told you. So uh, I would suggest, I do recommend officially, that you folks, uh, uh, you got one of seven choices. You, fo you folks uh, do avail yourself to the possible uh, benefit, maybe proven, that you'll change the way you die, but not the day you die. You'll change the way you die by doing one of these tests. Uh, by the way, if you look at those recommendations, uh, go to number two because uh, the Canadian Preventative Services Task Force uh, yet does not uh, strongly encourage its citizens in Canada to eat well, nor does any organization in the US. But they at least have it clear for their citizens that they should not taking, be taking this uh, extraordinary excessive risk of having a colonoscopy. See, my, my recommendations are almost, and have been for 30 years, almost exactly the same as those uh, from Canada. Do you think that's a coincidence? Do you think maybe they plagiarized my work? No. They just read the evidence, which is clearly available to you. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to give you another point of view. And hopefully this gives you uh, another chance to live your life, enjoy your children and grandchildren.
by making well-informed decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Lung, Doug Lyle will be with you in about 10, 15 minutes, and I will be with you, and this uh, conference will end at exactly 4 p.m. I will be with you afterwards to give you some uh, kind words and compliments and well wishes. So take a, a little bit of a break. Thank you. <laughs>